Okay, so welcome everybody to the Care and Support Nurse pilot webinar, this knowledge sharing event. I'm really pleased to be presenting this on behalf of my colleagues, Dr. Carol Gardner, Professor Alison Leary, Roberta Lovick, Adam Wagner, Jennifer Lynch, Guy Perrier, and Suzanne Lindquist. We have a fantastic wide ranging audience this afternoon um, across a range of settings, roles and geography. So it would really help us if you could mute your microphone unless we're in the Q&A session and you're asking a question. And um, please ensure that there's no clinical information visible or audible in your background if you're from a clinical setting. Um, note that you can hide or minimize participant video thumbnails um, in Zoom. But most importantly, please be aware that we are audio recording, as I've said, <clears throat> to enable further knowledge sharing. So what we're going to do in the webinar over the next hour is I'm going to give you an overview of the pilot, why and how we did it, and what the key findings were. Then I'm going to invite some very brief reflections from some carer representatives. So we're very pleased to have with us Dame Philippa Russell from Carers UK, who's their vice president, Sophie Little from Carers Voice, a local carer organisation, and Roberta Lovick, who's an experienced carer. And then we've got the, a Q&A session with Karen Murphy, who fulfilled the pilot care support nurse role for us and with myself. And then we'll finish with a, a brief few minutes about what will happen next, a call to action and close. So let's start off with an overview of the pilot, why and how we did it and what key findings were. Well, we also need to start by just being clear about what we mean by unpaid family carers. So these are lay people in a close supportive role who share the illness experience of the patient and who undertake vital care work and emotion management. These can be family, friends or neighbours, but they're often older with their own health problems. We know carers are important. They support patients with single or multiple physical or mental health conditions, often enabling them to stay in their place of choice and they dramatically reduce formal care costs nationally by over 130 billion a year. Locally in Norfolk and Waveney, this is estimated at somewhere between 500 million and 2 billion a year. But whatever the figures, they're set to increase as population demands for care increase. So the caring role is complex, it's multifaceted. It can be about managing complex systems, symptoms, sorry, providing personal care, care management, practical and emotional support, overnight vigilance. And it's a changing role. Also, the carer can be a carer to multiple people and they may not be geographically close to the person that they're supporting. Importantly for this project, we know that carers have unmet health-related support needs. So they can have health-related education needs and they may need specialist knowledge and skills, but can lack training. They, we also know that care, the caring role negatively impacts carers' physical and psychological health and even their mortality. And there are lots of reasons for this, but in part it's because they often put their own health second. They prioritise the patient they're supporting. It can be due to ambivalence, but just the day-to-day -day reality of the caring role and their limited time. It's also due to clinicians' limited time in supporting them. Carers, patients, sorry, clinicians in patient-facing roles tend to prioritise the patient rather than the carer. So there are threats to carer sustainability. The carer role is characterised by uncertainty and unpredictability. We've noted that carers are rarely acknowledged and largely unsupported by clinicians, and this threatens carer health and patient support, which can lead to patient and carer crises. And we know that supporting the carer actually supports two people, the carer and the patient. There's a health policy rhetoric around carers. Policy says that carers should be supported, but it gives us a little guidance on how this should happen. And there's increasing evidence that caring is a social determinant of health. Carers can struggle to access adequate services and support. And this report from Public Health England identifies that different groups of carers may have different support needs. Some groups of carers are at greater risk of poor health and experiencing adverse consequences of caring and may benefit from additional support. And the report suggests that carefully designed intervention with clear pathways to impact and robust evaluation are needed. So our solution to this was to develop a carer support nurse role, targeting nursing skills within existing structures, but across systems. And there were two evidence-based prerequisites for this role. 
First, that it's dedicated to carers, and second, that it's a registered nurse. Now, it's dedicated to carers due to carers' known reluctance to bother healthcare professionals during what they see as the patient's time, and nurses' challenge in supporting carers within their patient-led roles. And it's a registered nurse due to carers' known unmet health-related support needs, both their own mental and physical health needs, and needs in their caring role and the education and support that that requires. And importantly, this differentiates the carer support nurse role from other carer roles, such as social prescribers and care coordinators. So it's filling a unique gap identified by stakeholders that requires nursing skills complementing existing services. And one stakeholder described this as the missing piece of the puzzle. So the carer support nurse pilot was a one-year pilot which started in October 2022 funded by Norfolk and Waveney ICB and hosted by East Coast Community Healthcare. And the role was based in Great Yarmouth and North Village's primary care home team, which is a team of nurses, therapists and social care staff who support clusters of GP practices. So this was a collaboration between East Coast Community Healthcare, ECH for short, and University of East Anglia. And this saw healthcare and academia working together to develop an evidence-based role delivering evidence-based nursing practice. So in developing the role, we worked with over 70 stakeholders regionally across health, social care and voluntary sector, as well as national leaders in carer support. We also worked with over 100 carers and patients, and we were struck by the universal enthusiasm across this range of stakeholders for this pilot role. Locally, carers in Great Yarmouth confirmed the national evidence about the need for carer support. They told us that they often felt their needs were not met, but instead could feel that assumptions were made about how they were coping. They could feel abandoned or passed around by services and could feel underappreciated and overlooked. They welcomed the idea of the new carer support nurse role and felt it could create a space for their needs to be discussed provide opportunities to talk to a professional who understands how difficult it can be for carers to open up about their own needs and fill gaps in existing carer support. So there were five evidence-based design principles behind the role. First, that it's community-based. Second, that it involves cross-sector working, so receiving and making referrals across health, social care and the voluntary sector. Third, that it delivers person-centered care to carers with complex needs. For example, through use of the Carer Support Needs Assessment Tool Intervention, CESNAT I, which complements social care assessment practice. Fourthly, it tends to marginalise communities. And fifth, it seeks to be educational, both to carers and to other healthcare professionals, raising their awareness of carers and modelling best practice. So I'm really pleased to say that Karen Murphy fulfilled the role of the pilot carer support nurse at EC, and you'll hear from Karen later. And she did this on a one year secondment. She brought with her five years of acute care experience and over four years of community nursing experience. And together we developed referral criteria for the role. So the referral criteria were carers living within the locality who had complex support needs relating to or impacting on their own health or well-being or their skills or confidence to care, or unresolved health-related support needs that cannot be met by their usual healthcare team. The key thing in these referral criteria is that the complexity referred to lies with or relates to the carer rather than the patient. So to evaluate the pilot, the evaluation was led by University of East Anglia, funded by Health Education England, supported by the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration for the East of England and UEA Health and Social Care Partners. And we were really pleased to be joined on the team by collaborators from London South Bank University and University of Hertfordshire, and to be supported by a fantastic para public involvement group. We were also supported by the most remarkable advisory group, um, given that this was a pilot study. Um, I'm not going to read the names out, but if you have a scan of those names, um, you'll notice that there are some leading figures, um, some very busy figures on this list, which suggests um, that the role was felt to have potential um, amongst these particular stakeholders. So this was a pilot project. It's important to remember that it was a pilot. It was trying to answer, is this even possible? Might it work? And how can we find out if it works or not? 
and how it works or not, rather than simply does it work. So it was about leading the way for further work that can happen following this. It was a three-stage pilot. Stage one explored how the role could work. So we identified local, regional and national care resources that the nurse could use in her role. We conducted workshops and interviews to operationalize the role with local carers, health, social care and voluntary sector practitioners and a commissioner. In stage two, we evaluated the role and tested our evaluation methods. So Karen came into post mid-October 2022, and this was followed by a period of policy development and her induction. When she started seeing um, carers, we then were able to assess the value and impact of the role. So we looked at role activity, carer outcomes related to health-related quality of life, well-being, and preparedness for caregiving, as well as qualitative feedback from carers and patients and feedback from the health, social care, and voluntary sector stakeholders. Stage three was about developing recommendations. So whether and how to introduce the role elsewhere, what we learned about carer support and what we learned about evaluating the role. So I'm now gonna give you an overview of the key findings um, very briefly. I'm gonna look at which type of carers the nurse saw, what the carer support nurse did, what was the impact of the role on carers, what were key stakeholders views on the role as delivered, possible mechanisms of action for the role and our resulting recommendations. So I'll start by looking at which types of carers the carer support nurse supported in the pilot. Well, there were 124 referrals received over a nine month period, three quarters were female and the average age was 66. In terms of where the referrals came from, they were mainly from within healthcare but it was pleasing to see there were some self-referrals and also some referrals from social care and the borough council. In terms of the support needs that carers brought with them, well, as a group, these carers identified needing more support across the full range of items on the carer support needs assessment tool, which underpins CESNET I, and you'll remember is one of the core interventions that Karen delivered. The most frequently identified needs were looking after your own health, physical problems, and dealing with feelings and worries. And this suggests that referrals were in line with the referral criteria and our stakeholders' recommendations, which is pleasing. So what did the care support nurse do in the role? Well, she provided direct care support. This was about care role acknowledgement and listening person-centered assessment and solutions using CESNAT I, which meant opening up conversations about what was important to the carer and their unmet support needs, and then enabling solutions by responding together to physical, social, and emotional. It was about providing carer health screening and coaching and upskilling carers, and assessing risk of carer breakdown, providing crisis management, and identifying and managing safeguarding concerns. But as well as directly supporting carers, Karen also provided advice to other cross-sector professionals. She delivered training. She shared, was shadowed by other healthcare professionals. She attended multidisciplinary case conferences. She promoted the role through presentations and developed links with other organizations. And this last point was a key aspect of the role, which was identified across multiple data sources in the pilot, from our activity analysis, from our conversations with carers, and with stakeholders. So there was this extensive interprofessional, intersector working that was going on across health, social care, the voluntary sector, and emergency services, such that she was described by some as a super connector or a knowledge broker. Now this rather scary pie chart um, shows that the proportions of activity undertaken by the care support nurse and what it shows is that activity was distributed across different types of work and across the nursing process. So across assessment, planning, intervention and evaluation. And this shows the benefit of an experienced registered nurse being in the role. So it wasn't just chat and a signpost, but it was a full nursing assessment, then a plan and intervention, in particular in response to the psychological needs of carers, as well as their physical and social health needs. So most of the activity of the carer support nurse took place in carers' homes, which again was very pleasing, and carers really liked and welcomed this. They told us this in their feedback. 
Later on in the pilot, Karen was also able to offer clinic appointments, and both of these worked well for both carers and for Karen with her role. So what was the impact of the role on carers? Well, feedback from carers themselves was overwhelmingly positive. This was from carers who'd received support from Karen. Very interestingly, though, referral itself was seen as an intervention. There was a positive impact on carers just by being referred before there was a first contact with Karen herself. The carers particularly valued opening up conversations, sharing experiences of being a carer, discussing difficult issues and feelings with the, which they were then able to share with other family members. They also valued the practical support that was put in place for them. They welcomed the opportunity to re-engage if they needed to, but some said they sometimes needed a more proactive approach that might have been possible if there was a team rather than one nurse. So as carers particularly liked the fact that she was an experienced, mature nurse. As this carer said, she seemed to be a very good choice because she's obviously very experienced and you know she seemed to be able to cover everything as required. And this triangulates with that activity pie chart I showed you, evidencing the nursing process and the benefit of an experienced registered nurse being in the role. This created psychological safety for carers to express distress, then to be assessed and responded to together using actions such as direct care or referral on, as we saw in that activity analysis, based on assessment. Interestingly, we asked our carer PPI group what questions we should ask Karen at the end of the pilot. And one of the questions they suggested was, which skills does she feel have been priceless? And Karen said, I think you're definitely looking at a senior. You need the experience. People value the experience. I don't think that we would have had loads of people opening up as they have done with me, with someone who's fresh out of nursing school. You do need that life experience, that maturity. You need to have that. You need to be relatable. But what was the impact on carers in terms of quantitative outcomes? Well, with the caveat that this was a pilot of one nurse in post for one year, using data collected over just nine months on a small sample size that wasn't powered to answer this, this question. We did see a signal of improvement in carer health related quality of life, carer mental well-being, and their sense of preparedness to take care of the care for person's emotional needs in particular. But we could argue that any improvement or maintenance and outcomes is encouraging given the vulnerability and continuing caring trajectory and complex needs of these particular referred carers. So I just briefly want to share one case study of Susie who was a carer to her mother for many years, particularly in the last three years, she cared for her full time. Her mother had poor mobility, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and was deteriorating, and she was bedridden. Her care role was 24-hour care, um, including overnight vigilance. She provided personal care. She had had a background as a paid carer, but she described herself as the information hub for everyone in the family, often spending two to three hours on the phone each evening. Before Karen met with her, her support came from family and from some old colleagues. She described the district nurses as being there for her mother only and not to provide support for her. She was struggling with the overnight care and with her own health and she was referred to Karen by the district nurses. So what Karen did was she provided a home visit, which Susie really liked, and a follow-up phone call. And there was a further call planned um, for once um, Susie's mother had died. She had Karen arranged for sitting carers, particularly for those last three nights, which meant that Susie got some sleep, was less worried. And she just, when she spoke about Karen, she said she felt she knew where I'm coming from. She said she was kind, natural, asked, what do you need? And then identified and acted on issues related to anxiety, palpitations and accessing an ECG. She felt it was important that she was there in the first place and felt she made a big difference. It allowed me to be her daughter for the last three days of her life. When you're caring for somebody, liaising with healthcare professionals, dealing with her needs, you become sort of a bit like a robot. If it hadn't been for Karen coming in when she did, I don't know what I'd have done. I was on my knees. She was just very kind, very natural. There was no sort of, I'm the nurse here to tell you what you've got to do and you've got to do it. It was, I'm here, what help do you need? When she said, right, we've got somebody coming in to sit with your mum tonight, I went, wow, I was able to get a bit of sleep, be a bit more with my mum, sit with my mum, just not have to worry, will she be all right or not? 
Susie then went on to describe a series of other actions Karen took in relation to her physical and mental health. And she said, she made a big difference to my family's situation. If you want any more proof that this scheme works, there's your proof. There was also indirect impact on unreferred carers. One healthcare professional who'd worked alongside Karen said, it's been an eye opener. It's interesting, you forget about the carers. So it has highlighted that caring is a tough, tough job to do. It's good to highlight that. Staff have thought more about carers because Karen's been there. They've sort of gone, oh, actually, yeah, I've got, and I've noticed in meetings, nurses bringing up patients and carers that if Karen hadn't been there, would never have been raised. So what did key stakeholders think about the role as it was delivered? Well, we asked them about their perceived need for the role before it began, and nine of the 11 stakeholders we spoke to knew the role was needed before it started. The two who were unsure um, reported learning very quickly once Karen started in the role, how important the role was. In terms of how they valued the role once it was up and running, there was overwhelmingly positive feedback. They described the added value from this new resource, and at the end of the pilot, they expressed dismay that the role was ending. We asked them about those five evidence-based design principles I outlined at the beginning. They said all were delivered and that all remained relevant and important for the role going forward. But a few of them noted that working with marginalized communities takes some time to do and it takes longer than a one-year pilot, although good progress had been made. They described that there was a good fit with existing services, um, but some identified some operational refinements that would be helpful for the role going forward. This is a quote from someone, uh, a stakeholder from social care. I recently tried to refer someone through to Karen and was told, no, the service is no longer available. And I was gutted because there's very little else out there for carers. They're a voluntary organization. Yes, I get that. But this was specific for the carers and to look at their physical and mental health needs and to offer education and support and how best to support their loved one at home. So I found it was a really effective role and I'm quite lost without it to tell you the truth. And one more quote. You don't really realize what you've had until you've lost it. I've literally got a case in common in half an hour ago that Karen came straight to my mind to give support to, which is someone who's newly in the position to give palliative care to their father. And what's quite sad is that, that they're already looking forward to the time when their father dies so that it doesn't have this impact on them. You get this. So without a shadow of a doubt, once Karen came, I thought this is brilliant. I was really surprised this was the only care support nurse in the whole country. Yes, there's a need, 100%, somebody who's skilled to recognise certain responses to becoming a carer before it's too late. So we noted earlier that supporting the carer actually supports two people, the carer and the patient. But actually what we found through this pilot that supporting the carer through the carer support nurse role actually supports three people, the carer, the patient and the referrer. And I just wanted to share with you some unsolicited feedback from one medical practice in their locality. He said, we've been very fortunate to work with Karen and so far the difference she's making to our patients is incredible. Since December last year, she's seen 45 carers via various referral routes, which is the highest number of engagements for carer support over all the practice areas. So this is very positive that we're going in the right direction to ensure that unpaid carers are supported. We shared with our carer advisor PPI group some anonymized carer interviews from the pilot and asked them to give some feedback on them. And they were struck by how the carer support nurse was able to sort things for carers. They spoke about her remarkable connections, this super connector role, and her ability to help carers prepare and have headspace for their role. They also commented um, about her efficiency and what she could achieve within one visit. They felt her experience and maturity was a key factor in this. They also noted that there could be a more proactive role if it was a bigger service. But really interestingly and insightfully, they noted the need of support for the carer support nurse herself because she obviously took on quite an emotional burden in the role. So looking now very briefly at possible mechanisms of action, so how the role is working, well, the carer support nurse could be seen as a direct care intervention for unpaid family carers with complex needs. It can also be seen as a means to raise healthcare professionals' awareness of carers, to raise carers' awareness of their own support needs, to prioritise the identification and addressing of carers' health and wellbeing needs, 
to facilitate their access to healthcare for their own needs. It could also be seen as a conduit for implementing the care support needs assessment tool intervention. It's a provider of psychological safety and an absorber or container for some of the challenges and difficulties of the caring role. It's also a super connector and navigators of, for carers' health and well-being, and a super connector for cross-sector professionals in relation to carer health and well-being, and could also be considered a system designer or improver. And importantly, these possible mechanisms of action will help us to produce an initial logic model and program theory that we can test in the future. So to share with you now our resulting recommendations going forward from the pilot, well, we had 21 key recommendations. There are six pivotal recommendations and then further sets of recommendations relating to establishing and delivering the role in practice, organizational support for the role, enablement of the role and future directions. So I'm only gonna share with you on the next couple of slides, the pivotal recommendations but the full set of recommendations can be found in the executive summary and full report of the pilot, which I'll share a link to at the end if you've not accessed that already. So in terms of those six pivotal recommendations, the carer support nurse role is a mechanism for delivery on NHS pledges to support carers. Secondly, the carer support nurse role should continue to prevent loss of the opportunity to move to a sustainable role, prevent loss of developed skills and established networks. Thirdly, a team model would maximise reach and should be led by a Band 7 registered nurse supported by Band 6 registered nurses. Fourthly, those two evidence-based prerequisites for the role should remain. So first, that it's de dedicated to carers and second, that it's a registered nurse. The fifth pivotal recommendation is that an experienced registered nurse is recommended for the role as the work required is distributed across different types of nursing work and across the nursing process through assessment, planning, intervention and evaluation, as we saw in both the activity analysis and in carer and stakeholder feedback. Consideration should also be given to the relatability of the post holder or team members to the target population. And the final pivotal recommendation is that those five evidence-based design principles for the role should remain, including the use of the carer support needs assessment tool intervention as a core component of the role. So these were the six pivotal recommendations. And just to remind you, there are further recommendations relating to establishing and delivering the role, organization support for the role, enabling it, and future directions. So I'm very pleased to share with you that the Carer Support Nurse Pilot was regional winner in the NHS Parliamentary Awards in 2023 in the nursing and midwifery category. And we were also shortlisted for the Royal College of Nursing Award in the 2023 Innovations category. So we became one of 75 finalists from over 900 applications. But most importantly, it's the feedback from carers themselves and their endorsement, particularly those carers who received the role. And Joyce was one of those carers and she said, it's an essential role. I think it's a brilliant idea and I hope that it's rolled out. So to sum up this presentation and this part of the webinar in relation to the carer support nurse, there was an evidence-based and stakeholder identified gap in provision. Stakeholders, Felt and the evidence suggested that this was the right solution to try. It was co-designed with stakeholders using the evidence base, then operationalized with local stakeholders. The goal was to support carers with complex support needs relating to or impacting on their own health or well-being or their skills and confidence to care through delivery of those five evidence-based design principles. And the pilot care and support nurse role achieved this goal. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing the screen in a second. I'm going to invite some brief reflections from um, our care representatives who I hope we have on the call, the call um, which is Dame Philippa Russell, Vice President of Carers UK, uh, Sophie Little from Carers Voice, a local carer organisation, and uh, Roberta Lovett, who's an experienced carer. And then we'll have a, a hopefully a 15, 20 minute Q&A session with myself and with Karen. So I'm going to stop sharing now. 
There we go. And I'm going to invite Dame Philippa Russell just to share a few words with us. Philippa. Philippa, I need to ask you to turn your microphone on, please. Uh, I'm coming in. I'm coming in again. I don't know why it is. You're there. I'm here. Um, it's been a real privilege to be a member of the of the advisory group for this project because, as a long term carer myself, my husband had complex medical needs plus dementia. I have an adult disabled son in hospital at the minute, and we're in contact with ten different parts of the NHS about his discharge. And it seems to me that the carer's support nurse is a role which should have been developed a very long time ago. I know as Vice President of Carers UK from the thousands of carers who contribute each year to our state of care survey that about 70% now of family unpaid carers say they are worried about their own physical and mental health. They want to care, but somehow or another their well-being is not part of the equation in a world where services and support are very difficult. So what do I see as the huge benefits which a carer's support nurse would bring to me and to other and to and to other people? Firstly, as has already been said, the carer support nurse is a super connector. And if I think of the 10 different parts of the NHS that my son is is part is is part is part of in a sense at the moment, then I need somebody who is competent, as a super connector, who is a good communicator to make sense of everything that's happening. I also need somebody to actually look at me and say, am I coping? And to give me permission to actually look after myself because carers can be ground into the ground. And then thirdly, I think that a great strength of the carer's support nurse is that they can have the creative, compassionate conversations that enable everybody to be honest about what they need to do, how they can do it, and what the future might actually be. A carer's support nurse gives respect to carers, recognises, one carer said, my about that what she wanted was a recognition of her equivalent expertise. She said, I'm not a nurse, not a doctor, not a physio, not a social worker, but I know the person I'm caring for. And finally, I think the carer's support nurse role could be that missing piece in the jigsaw of a multiple mosaic collection of pieces of different professionals, different input, different community services that actually enable those of us who are unpaid carers to care at home. I just hope this project is the start of a movement. Thank you, Russell, uh, Philippa, for that fantastic endorsement. So I'm gonna pass over now to Sophie Little from Carer's Voice. Sophie, it'd be great to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Morag. Um, Hi everyone, yeah, I'm Sophie Little, Carer's Voice Co-Production and Project Officer. Um, we're an independent charity that ensures the voice of carers is heard into the design and delivery of services and we inc um, include all age carers in that. And just to really support what Philippa said, I think the care of support nurse, being that super connector, being on the ground, having that local knowledge, but also bringing in that health element is so important. Um, we have recently conducted um, an engagement uh, engagement piece with carers as part of the first all age carers strategy uh, for Norfolk and Waveney. And a quarter of carers who responded to our survey reported that they required support of their own mental health needs and 15.7% uh, responded that they have a physical disability themselves and like what's been already shared carers often put the, the person they care for first they don't have the time or capacity to think about their own health needs and they often are forgotten so having a dedicated person who is solely there for the carer allows them that time to really consider themselves their own needs and are supported um supported with these to ensure their own well-being I think that is what's so so needed and we massively support the rollout of the care of support nurse nationally I think it needs to happen thank you Sophie and then I'm just going to pass over finally to Roberta Lovick
Roberta, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. The more I, more I know how passionate I am about this role. I mean, I've, I've been involved since the beginning and um, it came as music to my ears when I knew this was going to happen. Um, I cared for my daughter um, with two very young children when she was dying at the age of 28 and her husband left us and I had my husband ill too. So um, you can imagine the dilemma I was in and what I wouldn't have given at the time to have had somebody like Karen to help me because it's it it's actually given carers permission to care about their own health. And as we know, if you don't care about your own health, <clears throat> you end up being the next um, patient along the line somewhere. And so I think what is so important about the role too is one day I was a market trader and the next day I was thrust into Karen, which I wanted to do with the best of my ability. But um, I had to look after Louise with drug regimes and all kinds of things whilst looking after the family as well. And um, I had no training whatsoever. I, wa I didn't have a medical background, so it was extremely difficult. So I think um, both elements uh, play a really important part, helping people to understand their care and role and helping people to care for themselves too. So thank you, Morag, for all you're doing. I can't thank you enough for this role. And I hope people now see their sense and back up because a carer's nurse across the whole country would mean such a lot to families when they're at their most desperate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. And thank you to all of our sort of carers voice uh, contributors. I'm really grateful to you for, for joining the webinar today and sharing your thoughts. Um, so I'm now really pleased to move us into the Q&A session. Um, very pleased to introduce you to Karen Murphy, who's uh, just popped her camera on there. Um, and to um, invite questions in the audience. So what you could do is if you'd like to put your hand up um, or type the question in the chat, um, if you prefer not to come up on a microphone um, and we'd be really happy to answer your questions. I'm sure you've got questions for, Ka for Karen herself in terms of how the role was delivered and what it was like for her, because you've probably heard enough from me. I'm just gonna check the chat to see if we've got any questions in there. Okay, so there is a question um, in saying, uh, where did the nurse sit and who undertook the clinical supervision and line management of the nurse? Um, so somebody who'd missed the start. Karen, do you want to explain that? Yes, of course. Thank you for the question. Um, I slotted in really um, to the the um, the primary care hub, so the primary care model, um, where we have a um, multidisciplinary team of nurses, um, physios, occupational therapists, um, all in in one office basically, and we all work together for the needs of the patient. So I tagged on to the back of that. It was a little bit. Um, it wasn't a perfect fit because obviously they were centered around the patient whereas I was centered very much around the carers however it did give me that resource and um the clinical supervision from the lead of that team um that I needed at the time um and I also basically put my little tentacles into any single little pie that I could find <laughs> and and tapped into things like the um the, the local council um different carers groups um the gp practices as well um but primarily we sat within the the primary care hub and so karen very modestly describing her little tentacles her little tentacles were amazing and actually as i mentioned and i hope i made clear in the presentation that that ability to network identify resources and network was really important so um b jones did i see your hand up yeah, just a quick, so I, I can't work out how to do it digitally. It's not Don't that worry. Easy. So it was me that put the question in about the supervision because when I worked at Barnet Carer Centre 20 odd years ago, sorry, um, my phone's going off. Um, we had a carer's nurse at Barnet and then when I moved to Enfield Carer Centre, we actually got funding from the then CCG for a carer's nurse. 
but the post never took off because no one would undertake the clinical supervision. So as a carer's centre, we couldn't do that. And we spent a whole year, myself and the CEO, trying to recruit and it kind of never happened. So I was interested to know how that had come about because that was a, we did actually have funding for a carer's nurse. And the way we've got around it now is we have a registered nurse who works at the carer's centre, but not in a clinical role, but as a trainer. So she does carers health and well-being days. She does um, hospital discharge training. She does things around prevention of, of readmission, around um, how carers can manage signs of infection, the importance of dehydration, all uh, hydration, all that kind of stuff. So we kind of got round it that way. But I was just quite interested to see where the sort of clinical role sat and, and how that had worked. And that's quite yeah. interesting as well, Fee, because everything that you identified there relates to the person they're looking after. Um, so that was part of my role the 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 bigger part of my role is actually looking after that individual carer and, yeah. and well, we do that as well we yeah. do care as well-being days and we yeah. do health check days where she does their blood pressure their bmi and we also do that in tandem with the doctor's surgery so when she goes to the surgeries and we do it in tandem with when we can with the, with the primary care nurses at the surgery so we do focus on the care as well we have a lot of care yeah, as right. sort of well-being days but that's kind of how we got around the whole clinical supervision thing so mm. wonderful it, it's it's so fantastic to hear about the the, the sort of the, the imaginative ways sometimes people have to make these roles evolve to make them work um it shouldn't have to be like that should it we should be able to support carers clinically directly um and and to do it you know given that the evidence base that that's surrounding it so i'm just checking in the chat there's a few questions popping up um diana, diana robinson's asked if this has become nationwide would it depend on local commissioning by by ics's or could GP practices take on the role and salary of the CSN? Diana, that's a really interesting question because I've just been having in the last few days some conversations um, about um, ARRS, the um, additional, oh, I can't remember what it stands for, additional role and responsibilities scheme, no, additional role reimbursement scheme, that's it, um, which funds um, additional roles in primary care to help reduce the workload for GPs um, and we're starting a little bit of discussion about whether that's a possible mechanism um, for funding the role but that would be at a PCN a primary care network level rather than by individual GP practices so it would require the whole of the PCN to sort of buy into the idea of the role um, and I'm hoping we might be starting a conversation about that um, otherwise it would be about local commissioning through the ICSs um, certainly um, I'm checking the screen. I can't see. I can't see any hands up on the page I'm looking at. Somebody shout if I'm missing them. So I'm going to keep going through the questions in the chat. Ben Jackson um, has asked. I said amazing project. Just wondered what the what evaluation was conducted to understand the financial benefit to primary secondary care. Thinking about building the financial business case. And I think someone else had asked a question about the the health economics. So um, Ben, because this was a, a pilot and a relatively small sample. What we did was start to explore what sort of data we could collect in order to answer this question in a future study, um, which might involve more nurses in varying localities to see how the role works in different localities with different populations. So we know that we can ask carers to complete um, things like the EQ5D to look at their health related quality of life, which can be important in um, health economic analysis. We can also look at um, the, the sort of uh, places they were referred to, um, services they were accessing before they received the care of support nurse and afterwards. So we've we can we've developed a case to be able to say we could measure this in the future, um, and uh, we will be doing some work with commissioners going forward to find out what outcomes are particularly important to them. And I suspect that this is going to be one of them. Um, so I'm just going to go over to so. Forgive me, Gun. I can see that Ben has got his hand up, and it might be in response to this particular point. So I'm going to go to Ben first, then I'll speak to Gun. Ben, uh, thanks, Maura. Yeah, sorry, but I was just going to, and um, I suppose anecdotally, then, Karen, from your day-to-day -day work and the the individuals you're working with, can you give some sort of uh, sort of context to people like myself who are not in the system to understand what day-to-day -day benefit you're sort of giving to primary and secondary care by supporting carers at this point? Is there any sort of anecdotal thoughts on it at this stage that we could use as part of that ongoing discussion with commissioners? I don't know whether or not more I would be able to answer that question better from the collated research. Um, 
I, I can, I can say something. And then if you want to chip in, Karen, if, if you think I've missed anything. So we've certainly got evidence of, um, I think, for example, if you think about that care I told you about, I shared the case study of Susie. Um, I think if Susie hadn't had the support she had had um, that Karen put in place, that would almost certainly have ended up in an emergency admission at the end of life for her mother, which would not have been what anybody would have wanted and would have um, been more expensive to the NHS. Um, and then we don't know what the, then the, the impact on Susie's bereavement outcomes might have been as well. So that's one example um, of, of um, intervention and impact on carers in terms of the sort of things that might be important to uh, commissioners. Karen, is there any else? Anything else you want yeah, to add to that? I mean, with, with doing obviously a, a, a holistic assessment for the actual the carers' needs and their own physical um, health, really, as well. I mean, we had one gentleman who we discovered following an assessment with myself that he had a, something annoying on his ear, turned out to be a basal cell carcinoma. Um, you know, another chappy who who was over um, medicating himself because his, he'd been taking this prescription for six months plus, um, but he needed a review of his medications. Um, so he actually ended up being taken off, off heart medications because his blood pressure was dropping, but he didn't have a good enough understanding as to the effects of the medication on his body. Um, so there, there's a lot of lot of little quirks along the way that I, that I came across where it, no, just to about the uh, the individual who doesn't give a second thought about themselves because they're so busy caring for the other person. Thanks, Karen. You got a thumbs up from Ben. Good, you had a question. Thanks for being so patient. <laughs> no worries. Um, so um, I suppose there's still a lot of evaluation to follow in terms of uh, uh, the benefits of of this role and also, you know, looking at how we, we can fund this continuation. But I, I, what was coming through quite strongly to me was how much um, your experience, Karen, um, had to do with making, um, making this role beneficial and effective. And I'm wondering in pragmatic terms, if we're going to try to roll this out, as a, a, an effective support for carers, how, how do we ensure that um, other people who take on this role actually come equipped to carry it out? Because you know, if, if you put somebody in the role who, who doesn't know what they're doing, it's, it's not going to be of benefit. So how do we, um, how do we uh, manage to uh, make sure that everyone who takes on this as a role has also the required skill, experience, knowledge. How do we? Um, you yeah, know. I think from my perspective, I mean, obviously, I've had quite a, a broad range. I was lucky to have worked in the acute se et sector as well as working in the community. So I had that di diversity behind me, um, a bit of a, um, you know, no, what, what do they call it? Expert in nothing, but no, I, I knew quite a bit about different things. Um, but um, <laughs> Truth be known, I didn't really understand the role when I first came into post. Um, it's something that I had to learn along the way. And I was really very much led by the carers. So using the Cessna intervention and actually saying to them, OK, what do you need? What do you identify as your needs? So they're telling me, I'm not telling them. I then took a lot of that away. And as I took it away and I tried to find solutions to things from their own health conditions to having the oven cleaned to not being in suitable accommodation to needing equipment um my um uh, no, the, my connections then grew because i took on i took all that burden on really for them of all the things that they couldn't deal with um and and tried to find a solution um i was quite upfront that i couldn't find solutions to everything but i was quite surprised at what i could solve um just by making calls and obviously as time progressed that then grew so i already knew that i could tap into that resource or i could tap into this resource because i've used them before um and um and also find little pots of money that that were squirreled away particularly with the council um you no know, for for things as well that we could know dip into as well to have things paid for um rather than people having to pay for themselves i've had people with un 
carers with uncontrolled diabetes because they can't afford a well-balanced diet themselves as well as meet the additional needs of the person that they're caring for so you know it like there was that a huge diversity of what people's needs were and that's how I built my connections by listening to the carers finding out what their issues were and going out and finding a, finding a solution Thanks, Karen. I just add to that for in answer to you, Gun. Um, I think this is why we've got one of those pivotal recommendations is around getting the right person in the role, essentially. Um, their background is important, the experience they bring. Karen's being very modest in terms of the experience she brings and her expertise. But it's also about some of the training that happens um, during the induction period, particularly in relation to CESNAT I, um, making sure that whoever's in post completes that tra that specific training. Um, and also ensuring that, as some other people have mentioned, that there's adequate supervision going through while the person is in post. Um, so I think mm. having all those things in place, having a good job description, um, which is, again, in, in one of the recommendations, um, you'll see that that's an area that could be um, improved <laughs> on. Um, so it's a whole package of things, I think, that need to be in place. So I'm going I, to... I, I... Sorry, Gun. Do come no, back. I was just say, going to say it really quickly as well, but it, it was very strong what you were saying there as well, Karen, about the listening also making a difference to you and, and your role so yeah thank you absolutely and that was so important to the carers themselves they said that um so garud you've been very patient oh it'd be tragic if you can't unmute after waiting that long mm -hmm. I'm, I think you can hear me now. Good. Good. Lovely. Um, no, I just want to say it's really interesting to listen to all of this. I'm in a situation where um, I've been a learned disability nurse for 40 odd years. I've worked mainly in the community. Most of our role historically was always supporting families and parents and paid and unpaid carers. Um, so that has naturally been part of our service. Our service has now changed. Um, whereby the referrals are so task-led, people don't have time to support the carers. I've also worked in the private sector in a home care, um, care at home service, where our role became care supporting carers because no one else had time, be it social services or health. Um, and that was amazing because this role is so vital because we ended up being pushed into, I mean, it was only my knowledge that meant I could push things a bit but you're ending up supporting families of a person to access somebody at the Norfolk and Norwich somebody in the surgery somebody at social services somebody at housing and it's just huge and as a carer which I now am I've always been a peripheral carer for my father who's cared for my mum with her mental health for all her life now both of them have got dementia um so I'm sort of now still working but still trying to care for them and even though I know my way around the system and I like to think I'm fairly okay it still means your whole life goes by the board um, my brother is not in care so he's struggling with it and I, I feel under a lot of pressure so even as a as a professional this role would be great because it gives you some support you know whether you're trying to get continence pads and you're trying to work your way around a system to get something or you just need somebody to listen to your concerns when they're too you think well my dad might have had a TIA yeah 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 yeah. you know it's all it's so many things it's such a vast array um of of issues as a carer and you know I've noticed now I've not had a holiday for 20 months I've lost contact with nearly all my friends and everything and I've been to Carers Matters, and much as that's a very good organisation, there's nothing they can all offer me. And, you know, all right, the money's very useful if somebody wants the carer's allowance, but 50 quid a week isn't going to make my life better, unfortunately. It's about the emotional and physical support, which I think this role is brilliant. Ironically, I am actually working for the ICB currently on a retire and return um pilot which is a legacy nurse pilot um, where our role all comes to the end at the end of March but I can see the legacy nurse role which is hanging on to people who've got experience and knowledge and some confidence to even make a phone call you don't have to know everything it's about the confidence to find it like Karen said yes 
that role would actually dovetail into this as well, very well. And that's a national pilot, but that's not really going anywhere in the community. It's sort of focused around acute trusts at the moment. So it's it's just really interesting to listen to all of this um, and just think it's so valuable. And I think a team would be amazing because that way you bring so many different skills, you know, um, into into one team. And it doesn't, you know, it can be a very diverse team that way. Absolutely. Thank you, Sue, for sharing all of that. And I think you've probably answered a couple of the questions that are in the chat. So I'm just noticing one from Rahul who asked, what made you realise the role was required? Um, what makes, and why did you feel that nurses have not been conditioned to act um, for the carer too? And I think you probably completely answered that question, Sue, in yeah. your answer. I'm acutely aware of um, limits on time. We've only got about four minutes left. So we will, if there are questions in, in the chat. Oh, I'm just going to mute Sue if I can. Um, so um, I'm, there are questions in the chat and we will answer those by email um, if we're able to, um, because I believe I've got people's email if people would like that. So what I'm going to do is just share some finishing slides. Um, and, but first of all, thank Karen very much for um, contributing to um, our Q&A there. Yeah, so I'm just gonna close that chat and share my screen again very briefly for these last few. Uh, Oh, wrong button. There we go. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. So um, we are going to move on. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just tell you about what's going to happen next, um, our call to action, and then we will close. So I just wanted to remind you again that this was a pilot. We were trying to answer if it was even possible, if it might work. Um, and whether or not we could find out if it worked and how it worked. So this is about leading the way to more work. And I think we can answer yes to all of those questions. It is possible. It worked in this locality with this nurse. Um, we managed to collect data from multiple sources so we could assess the value and impact of the role and also start to explore how it works. If you're wanting more information um, about the pilot, um, there's a dedicated website on the Arc East of England website. The link is there and a QR code. And on there, you'll find links um, towards the bottom of the page for the final report, um, which is quite beefy, um, the executive summary, and also a lay summary. Um, in terms of what will happen next, um, there will be a delicate resource pack, which I hope I'm going to be able to make available to you. We're also seeking funding to explore the role in varying localities. And so we're also seeking localities. So please get in touch with me if this is of interest. Um, we will be running some commissioner workshops in April to find out what excites and concerns them about the, the intervention and the role, um, what outcomes they would like to see, and also whether they're interested in partnering, partnering us um, for a larger pilot. So our call to action is for you to think about whether this could work in your locality, whether we can have discussions about it going forward. Please get in touch, email me. I'm always very happy to jump on MS Teams and chat about this. I could talk about this role all day. So I'm just going to finish now with two thank you slides. First of all, to thank Norfolk and Waveney ICS for their funding for the role, to thank um, NHS England for funding the um, pilot evaluation, to East Coast Community Healthcare for hosting the role, to the NHR Applied Research Collaboration for the East of England and UEA Health and Social Care Partners for supporting the evaluation, but really importantly to thank the pilot participants and supporters, so the carers, patients, and health and social care and voluntary sector stakeholders who contributed to the pilot, and our carer PPI group who've been happy to be named, which is Sue Schofield, Les Redfern, Kevin Manier, and Roberta Lubbock. But most importantly, um, I need to thank this person. Um, this is probably my best and last opportunity to thank you, Karen, publicly for what you've done for this pilot. Thank you for fulfilling this long imagined role with such commitment, expertise and enthusiasm. Thank you for delivering it as intended and for helping us show how it can work. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm leaving you with this closing slide with my contact details and once again, the QR code to the dedicated webpage. Thank you for joining us.